It's great to be with you all this week. I'm really looking forward to, even for whatever opportunities we have, to even to chat with different ones of you uh, as we have opportunities to talk about what we're going to be talking about this week. You guys have a great opportunity this week, and I'm sure you know, for, uh, because many of you have already been here for several weeks, but you're able to study something you love, or at least you like. <laughs> I'm not sure. I hope you love what you're doing. Uh, but you have an opportunity to develop your giftedness, to make and enjoy friendships, and last but not least, to explore how all this fits into a relationship with Jesus and what he is doing in the world. And in the time I have with you, that's what I would like to do. Explore that with you, your, your vocations as people made like God. And it, um, I kind of wish that someone had done with that with me, but our talks that we'll have this week were really not part of the normal conversations of what it meant to live as a follower of Jesus in the world when I was sitting where you are in high school, and then when I came to what was then Philadelphia College of Bible, which then became Philadelphia Biblical University, which then became Cairn University, which is where we're holding it here. I was a music major. Um, I was a piano and church music major, and I loved my time here in a Christian college studying the Bible and music, so much so that, that that's what I wanted to do, teach music in a Christian college. So I graduated here in 1977, and in 1979, I got a master's in musicology, got married, began working in my church as a music director, and also having the opportunity to teach the Bible. And little by little, I felt God leading me to go to seminary and to go into the ministry. Now, nothing wrong in that, except for my reasoning and my understanding of ministry, quote, unquote. I said to myself, and I also said to others as I was processing this, what would I rather do for a work, for a career, teach music? or go into full-time ministry to communicate God's word which can change lives. And people would affirm that and said yes and amen to that. Instead, what do you hear in that comparison? I hope you distinctly hear a separated view of life, a separation in which those of us in, quote, full-time ministry, pastors and missionaries are the primary ones doing God's work, doing ministry, and then there is everyone else, musicians included. Nothing wrong in being a pastor or missionary. Thinking that one is more spiritual or one has more dignity or one is the work of God and the, the one really isn't, is wrong. And this is a, and a phrase that we like to say when we're talking about these things is, if you or your pastor goes to work for different reasons, then at least one of you is going to work for the wrong reason. Think about that. So right from the get-go, we want to begin with God's perspective of work. Now, work is any defined in the dictionary. Work is activity, any activity involving mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a result. And normally when we think of what's our work, we think of employment. But the concept of work goes far beyond employment. So it includes family. My two grandchildren, I had to get a picture of that out there because they're a major part of our lives. And that encompasses, that's included in work. Your school is work, only you don't get paid for it. But it's work. Your practice, when you go out from here and you practice and you rehearse, that's work. So what we're talking about is our whole lives, whole life living on purpose in whatever you do, encompasses our work. So beyond the immediate purpose of your school and this music camp, which is to get an education or to better your music skills, 
What is the ultimate purpose of our work? Well, there's that famous verse in 1 Corinthians that says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever it is. Whatever. Whatever. He's not leaving out anything. And he says, do all to the glory of God. Now that's religious language, guys. That's, that's language we hear all the time in our church. Do all to the glory of God. and all. But what does that mean? Well, we have to sort of bring that down a little bit. That simply means displaying God through whatever we're doing and how we speak from a pure heart with right attitudes, right motives, through which God accomplishes his work in the world. We're displaying him. And so very simply, our work is to be a reflection of God and means of his work in the world. Your work, even now, your vocations, all that God will lead you to do is significant because you are significant. You reflect God and you are his means of making this world a better place. And whatever we do can display God and advance his mission, his work in the world. And whether that means reading to my grandkids to invest in them for Jesus' work in their lives or living out your faith by playing in an orchestra, creating beauty and loving people you work with, or preaching from a pulpit, or going to another country, whatever, you can display God in that. So we begin at the beginning, first page of the Bible, if you want to turn to it, Genesis chapter 1, first page of the Bible, where God creates the heavens and the earth and the universe with the beauty, with the complexity, with the magnificence, reflecting his majesty, his power, his enormity. He, he creates all the vegetation, all the plants, all the animals in the heavens and the earth and, under, and in the seas. He creates everything. And incidentally, in case you're wondering, a couple of these pictures, if you haven't been there, they're, they're pictures from the Sistine Chapel in Rome uh, by Michelangelo, who painted it while I was laying on his back for months doing this and offering it to God. Uh, but w God created all these things, but not like him. Not like him. So it's as if God said within the Trinity, all this beauty and awesomeness and, and animals and plants, all, the all this, and we can't share it with anyone. It can't reflect us well. So let's make someone who can. And it's as if, it's a, can you imagine practicing your, what you're going to be practicing to do in a recital, playing in an orchestra, playing in whatever, and you're practicing and you get it to almost perfection, as much as perfection can be, and you have no one to share it with. You can't play it for anyone. It's only for you in the practice room. And you can't do anything with it. There's no one who will listen to you, no one who will resonate, no one who can interact with you. That would be kind of a downer. Now, it's not as if God needed that, needed us, but he wanted to create us like himself, who can experience his love and beauty and give it back to him. So in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, abbreviated, well, let me read those verses. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over all. So abbreviated, it's, let us make man in our image, male and female, according to our likeness. And then he commands them, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over every living thing. That's the original mandate of God to humanity, the original great commission of God. You've heard Jesus say, go into all the world. Well, God said that on the first page of the Bible in Genesis multiply and fill the earth, go into all the world. So God creates humanity and gives them, male and female, the highest dignity and value that anyone could ever give. We are like him. And Psalm 8 expresses it beautifully. You have made, 
this is, he says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've created, what is man that you care, take care of him, the son of man, that you're mindful of them? And then he says, yet you have made him a little lower than God. And you crown him with glory and majesty. And so that's where we get the phrase, you are the, we are the crown of creation. We are people made like God. We reflect God. You bear the image of God. We were created to worship and enjoy God in relationship and reflect Him in the world like no other part of creation. And so they're important verses. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And Genesis 1 answers that. You are the special design of God, His artwork, His crown of creation, created to love Him back and to love others and care for His world, doing His work in whatever you do so that He is glorified, so that He is displayed through our reflection. So what do you and I reflect about God? Well, we normally think of our abilities to reason, to feel, to make decisions, and most importantly, to know God. Humans pray. Animals don't. Praying mantis notwithstanding. And one of the things we notice is that it takes male and female to fully reflect the image of God. They are distinct but equal in value and dignity as those bearing His image. And not only, but Genesis 1 speaks of the equality and dignity of all human beings, no matter what race or ethnicity, as being in the image of God. And I mentioned that this morning, my friend, guys, because these truths are desperately needed in a world characterized by confusion and sexuality and ongoing racism all over the world. And these verses speak directly to it. So the image of God, I believe, can be summed up in three broad realities that are woven together. We reflect God's love, we reflect His justice, and we reflect His work. First, we reflect God's love. God is love. It doesn't mean that He just loves us. He is love. Father, Son, Holy Spirit that love each other without competition. Can you imagine that? No competition. Centering on the interests of the others. None demands, not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, none demands that the others revolve around Him. It's the opposite of self-centeredness. And it's been compared to a dance where each voluntarily circles the other two, pouring delight and adoration into them. Each person of the Trinity loves, adores, defers to, and rejoices in the others. So we have a unity with diversity creating a beautiful picture of what it means for us to love people, of what it means for us to create beauty. And in fact, it's the model for believers in Jesus. Jesus said that we would be one like, like they're one. But imagine, but you guys have an opportunity to experience that because it's sort of like when you accompany someone. When, you, when the pianist accompanies a vocalist or an instrumentalist, what are they trying to do? Well, I'm not going to get technical here, but in very simple language, they're trying to make that person shine. And when you play in an orchestra, or you play in a band or an ensemble, what are you trying to do? You're not playing just for yourself. You're part of a whole where it's not about you, but it's about what you are creating and the beauty that you're creating and all of that. And it's a beautiful thing. In Italian, we have a word, it's called affiatamento. And it's a word that talks about the harmony and the, and the resonance and all that you have when you're playing together and you experience something together that you cannot experience by yourselves. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And it's no surprise that everyone on this earth desires to know that kind of connection, that kind of love that's not centered on ourselves, but that's centered on creating something beautiful. Because, and it's not a surprise, because we're made in the image of God who is perfect love, demonstrated more than anything else in Jesus. So love, or the lack thereof, is often also a subject of a lot of music, especially country western. Now we're not going to go there, but, 
but we, we hear about, it's the subject of many, many lyrics of music and all, and I'm, and I'm not sure what music you listen to or the movies you see, but has anyone here seen the movie Bohemian Rhapsody? Well, it tells the story of a British rock group, Queen. Has anybody heard of Queen? Good, I'm glad, because they were a little while ago. But they're Queen, uh, uh, Queen and its lead singer, Freddie Mercury, and in case you're not familiar with them, they're the ones who wrote the song, We Are the Champions, you know, that, that one there in the Mighty Ducks movies. Um, <laughs> Freddie Mercury died in 1991. And he wrote in one of his last songs, The Show Must Go On, and this is what he wrote on the Miracle album in this song. Empty spaces, what are we living for? On and on, does anybody know what we are looking for? Inside my heart is breaking, my makeup may be flaking, but my smile still stays on. Whatever happens, I'll leave it all to chance. Another heartache, another failed romance. On and on, does anybody know what we are living for? Outside the dawn is breaking, but inside in the dark I'm aching to be free. The show must go on. And Mercury had amassed a huge fortune, had thousands of fans, but in an interview shortly before his death, he said, you can have everything in the world and still be the loneliest man, and that is the most bitter type of loneliness. Success has brought me world idolization and millions of pounds, dollars, you know, but it's prevented me from having the one thing we all need, a loving, ongoing relationship. And reality is, as much as we are created for human relationships, not even the best human relationships can satisfy entirely and cannot be completely ongoing. Sooner or later, they're done. We were made for more. We were made for an ongoing, eternal, loving relationship with Jesus, who is living. We also reflect God's justice. His perfectness, his holiness, there's no injustice to compromise his love. In the scriptures, God wants to make things right in the world. Keep that in mind. That's what God is about doing in this world. He's about making things right in this world that were ruined by sin. We'll look at that. He's involved in rescuing people. He's involved in promoting impartiality, fairness, what we call equity. Justice, and he's involved in restoration, reversing injustice and bringing wholeness, bringing flourishing, bringing healing. And amazingly, my friends, this is, what, this is what gets me all the time. Amazingly, you and I are the means of him doing that because we reflect his justice and love, you and I. Micah 6 eight sums it up well when it says, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? And interestingly, everyone on the earth, knowing Jesus or not, atheist or not, desires justice and hates injustice no matter how they may define it. So bullying, abuse in any form, teachers who aren't fair, Sex trafficking, slavery, inequality of any sort, unjust politics, persecution of Christians and persecution of other religions, governments characterized by corruptions. There's lots and lots of injustice in the world. We read about it every day. But significantly, you guys are here. And you guys are the future generation to show powerfully God's love and justice in the earth as demonstrated in the gospel when Jesus died and rose again to pay for all the injustice, all the mess, all the evil, all the wrong that's in the world. Jesus died for that. And you and I are the means of showing his love and his justice in the world through whatever you do and wherever you go. And lastly, we reflect God's work, the infinite variety of God's abilities and works which humanity reflects. We are all wired differently with different abilities and skills, but all reflecting God. One Australian writer has called God our 
vocational director and model. He has made you like himself and given you your gifts, your abilities, your aptitudes, which reflect some aspect of him and his work in the world. And he gave you these gifts and abilities that you're developing. Why? Why did he do that? So that you can steward them. Do we understand that word steward? To manage them? To arrange them? To use them? To make the world a better place? Living out God's love and justice as you work well in whatever you do. So how do you reflect God with your musical ability? How does that reflect God? You're creative like he is. You create beauty. Music has a unique power over our emotions. It's absolutely incredible. That page of scribble there reflects a page of Handel's autograph of the Hallelujah Chorus. Something known around the world that believers or non-believers, whatever, wherever this is sung, people stand up and take notice. It's a powerful, powerful piece of music, as other choruses are in that work and many other works. You can make people, music has the power, you can make people feel better through the beauty you create. You can help them flourish. Do you remember the story of David in the Old Testament? David was a teenager. He was your age, and he soothed King Saul and his fits of demonic rage by playing his heart, harp. And incidentally, that's kind of, the, there's some of the roots of music therapy, of using music to help people heal, to help people flourish. And as you intentionally manage and arrange how and where to use your music, wherever you are, you will have opportunity to love and help people that God brings your way, or in the words of Jesus, you will have opportunity to make disciples through your vocation of music, if you choose that, showing people the love and beauty of Jesus through how you create your music and how you love people in doing so. So Genesis 1 tells us who we are and why we are here, we are made like God to love and worship him and to display him to others through the love and justice we show as we work wherever and whatever it may be. And in all of it, we point people to Jesus. I'd like to play this very short video. Every day, God sends us his people, young, old, and everyone in between, out into his world, to the places we normally go, work and school, gym and shop, field and factory, to the people he's put us alongside, to do good work that brings good to others, ministering love and grace, snuffing out injustice, and speaking truth with kindness, sharing Jesus in word and deed, to see brows unfurrow, hearts soften, wounds heal, people set free. Home, school, work, a nation changed. Day by day. Shall we close in prayer? God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather this day. We present our day to you, God, and all that we do. May we display you in it well, as we love others well. And may God, may you just show yourself 
today in our lives and through our lives. We pray in Jesus' name.